ladies and gentlemen. It is a proud moment for us at Ponda Education Societies, Rabi Naik College of Arts and Science, Farmagodi, Goa, to host a public lecture on Indian lunar missions, which is a part of the 22nd National Space Symposium, jointly organized by Indian Space Research Organization, Goa University, Government of Goa, and other organizations. On behalf of Ponda Education Societies, Rabi Naik College of Arts and Science, the management, Principal Professor Vikas Pisulekar, Vice Principal Dr. Satish Keruskar, staff and students, we extend a heartfelt welcome to our esteemed guest speaker, Shri A.S. Kiran Kumarji, Chairman of the Apex Science Board and former Chairman of ISRO. Without further ado, let us commence this extraordinary journey into the mysteries of space and start the resourceful session on Indian lunar missions. Hey, good afternoon to all of you. So what I intend to do is initially just give you a glimpse of how India started its space activities before we get into the Chandrayaan mission itself. Probably you are all very familiar Way back in 1957, humanity got a new way of a new technological capability, a very disruptive technology. For the first time, an object was put into space by Russians in 1957. And at that time, India was a fledgling democracy just 10 years into independence. After centuries of external rule, it was struggling to provide food, shelter, education to its citizens. And at that time, we had great visionary scientist, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, who was looking at how this capability of going beyond planet Earth can help India make big strides and provide necessary solutions to the specific problems we were facing. And in that, what Dr. Sarabhai did was in a way convinced his friends across America, Russia, France, and Germany, telling them that in India, we have a very unique place called a geomagnetic equator in Tumba, in, a, in Trivandrum. And if we conduct upper atmospheric research by sending these sounding rockets into space, it will benefit the scientific community. And with that in mind, he was able to get sounding rockets, in a way you can say, Today we are all familiar with do-it-yourself kits. So getting those sounding rockets in the form of kits got it assembled and launched from Tumba. And this was done way back in 1963, the first of that. And you have seen, in fact, the Rangoli that is done outside also has captured that the rocket being carried on the cycle. So that's how India started its program. And what made a difference is India is the only country which started working on space technology for non-military purposes. All other countries work for space technology or use of space technology from military purpose. What in, Dr. Sarabhai also did was he convinced Americans that they should allow us to borrow one of their satellites which they were building in the mid-70s and using that satellite provide communication, broad, broadcasting capability across the country. Today, we are all very familiar, a small set-top box with a quarter meter antenna on our rooftop, we are able to see the television program. Way back in 75, if you probably ask your parents or grandparents, they will tell only four cities in India had the privilege of looking at broadcasting service. At that time, what India did, ISRO did was developing this capability of what is called direct to community sets, borrowing a satellite from America, moving it over Indian longitude. And probably you are also familiar that different objects at different heights from Earth take periods which vary from one and a half hours to, like for moon takes 28 days to go around Earth. So there is a place at 36,000 kilometers distance from Earth where the satellite takes exactly 24 hours, which means relative velocity with respect to Earth's rotation becomes zero. So the satellite becomes a tower at the height of 36,000 kilometers, 
and this enables one third of the globe to be suitable for line of sight communication. So what India did was, in 2,400 remote villages, ISRO demonstrated that you can use the satellite technology for quickly reaching information to the people in the country. And both communication and broadcasting, if you see, India is three and a quarter million square kilometers in size. An alternative that was required, available at that point is, every kilometer you put a microwave tower and then you can do communication. So if you see, if you had to cover the entire country, you would have required three and a quarter million such units and both time and effort would have been enormous. Though the satellite way was the quickest and that's what was demonstrated by India at that time. And another thing that was done is, in terms of weather, super cyclones used to kill many thousands of people. Using space technology, you can make sure that not only you learn about the arrival of the cyclone in the coastal region, but also prepare yourself for dealing with the vagaries of the super cyclone. Today, the, with the satellite information, you can tell exactly which place the cyclone is going to come days in advance, so the disaster relief agencies are able to evacuate people there and save lives. In the earlier decades, it used to be tens of thousands of people used to lose their life. Today, with the satellite technology, we are able to make sure that such a loss of life does not happen. And another thing was enabling using satellite, both for telehealth and teleeducation. And another very interesting, of course, you can also collect a lot of data about regions and then see how changes are occurring, whether it is snow cover or other aspects and study about climate, so that is possible. Then with this kind of thing, today you have a large number of satellites operating, collecting data, because you can visualize satellites do not have any state boundaries or national boundaries to worry about. From space, everything is accessible. You can collect data and make use of it for various applications. And India has built a significant amount of satellites and then providing various applications for this activity. And in doing this, not only probably one, uh, one more aspect I missed, uh, maybe I should tell you that before I go further. So one other thing that happened when Dr. Sarabhai was doing this experiment was he had to convince the fishermen in that region, telling them that you vacate this place for us to conduct these rocket experiments, one day the country will benefit. What has happened subsequently is from 1999 onwards, we have been able to provide specific information to the fishermen, telling them where they have, can go for fishing. How is this done? By looking at the color of the ocean from the satellite, identifying from that color where the chlorophyll is, and from that chlorophyll, identify where the fish food chain is, and through that, locate a place in the ocean where the fisherman is assured of catching the fish. Today, with our Navic satellites, we are also able to go one step further. One small battery-operated gadget is fitted into the boat of the fisherman, and this gadget picks up signal from the Navic satellites, not only locates itself where is in the ocean, and it communicates with the mobile in the hands of the fisherman, and in the mobile there is an app which shows to the fisherman through a video compass mode where he has to go for fishing. Not only that, it tells him in his mother tongue any adverse situation because of heavy rains or wind speeds or even sea state roughness not being bearable. And many times you would have read in your papers that our neighboring countries capture these fishermen because they are wading into the waters of their national territories. And here, the gadget, the mobile, gives him alert in his mother tongue. So you can see in this example, this has been happening starting from 1999, and with our Navic satellites, the today large, about three companies are making more than one lakh such units, and state governments are going to provide this to the fishermen. A person who does not know reading or writing is getting, taking advantage for his livelihood of 
the most advanced technology of Lockheed, putting a satellite into orbit and its application. And then this act alone saves to the country between 15 to 20,000 crores a year because the fisherman doesn't have to search for his fish catch. The amount of petrol and diesel he saves is what is saving in this fashion. So this is one of the very important development that happened and what Dr. Sarabhai had actually promised the fishermen became a reality. Now, today with the kind of space technology capabilities, the various applications that are there, whether it is monitoring of the weather or even crop forecasting, crop assessment, and all this happens. And one of the things that happened is, the usage-wise, what happens is if you go to somebody and tell him what he is doing can be done very differently, the first reaction of that person would be, I know my job better, who are you to tell me? But then, with a lot of persistence, perseverance, you can make sure that you can bring in that technology for usage. The Honorable Prime Minister actually had made extensive use of this technology when he was the Chief Minister of Gujarat. And when he became the Prime Minister, we conducted an event in Delhi where all the secretaries of state and central governments were brought together. And they were showcased how space technology can be used for various usages, and since then, the usage has become extensively increased. And then what India did in a way, you can see, it started addressing the use of technology for specific issues which it had, whether it is the solving the problems of the fishermen, education, health, or even with respect to monitoring, and also neighboring countries you can see for surveillance and other various aspects, today we have more than 60 plus satellites doing a lot of these activities. So in a way, when India started this program of space, it was looking at how it could address all these problems. And in this, one of the key things is what is called as a leapfrogging technology. That means, what is leapfrogging? See, you see, if you want to do a high jump, reach a certain height, you have to run a distance generate enough momentum, and then using that momentum, you reach a height. But if you do not have even that much space for building up momentum, what do you do? You know frogs, for example, they crouch at the same place and they can jump, and that is leapfrogging. And what India did was, whatever technology it was accessible to us, made use of it, but addressed it for solving the specific problems we had. And today, India is recognized globally for using space technology for many societal application. While all this happened, world is not remaining stationary, it's moving ahead. So we also needed to do many other things. So that's what I'll touch upon now. That is the prime top topic of today's talk is our lunar missions. So initially when we started developing our capability, we were putting the satellites into low Earth orbit between 500 to 900 kilometers where the satellite takes roughly one and a half hours to go around the Earth. And using that, you can do communication, broadcasting, etc. And geostationary satellite, like I pointed out, is one which takes you to a height of 36,000 kilometers and appears to operate, remain stationary with respect to you. Then, after we, in a way, built our own capability of going there, we were looking at Moon, which was 3,85,000 kilometers when it is closest. And that is almost 10 times the distance from geostationary orbits. And then Mars is many million kilometers away. So these are the different capabilities that were required to be established. And then what was done is, all this when it is done, probably you would also would have read that we take a long time to reach Moon or Mars or many of these. Today, why this is required is, again, what I was trying to tell you, leapfrogging. We had a lot of resource constraints and technological capability when you are building. Unless you have significant amount of resources, you cannot build a capability which is very strong. But then, within what we had built, if you were to attempt and reach moon, we had to find alternate ways of doing it. So what was done is, when the rocket, what we have built, can put a satellite into a certain orbit, an elliptical orbit. How an elliptical orbit is reached is, this rocket takes the satellite to a particular distance from Earth, 
say 170, 200 kilometers. And from there, depending on how much energy you impart to the object, you get into an elliptical orbit where the point of release becomes the closest point to the Earth and the other side, it becomes the apogee or the farthest point. If the sat launch vehicle itself cannot put the satellite directly to go to Moon or Mars, what we did is, whatever elliptical orbit to which the satellite could be put by the rocket, we took that and built the capability in the satellite where every time the satellite comes to the perigee point, you add a small velocity to it. So because of that addition, you go to a further point. So in this fashion, you keep building up your apogee point, and then finally, you can reach what is called as lunar transfer trajectory, or even Mars, or even Aditya when we have gone. In all these, we have made use of this capability. And using this method, with the limited resource we had, we were able to perform actions which were otherwise, which otherwise would have demanded launch vehicles of much higher capacity to be built. So here, initially you take every apogee point to be increased from the satellite orbiting Earth, and then after that, you go to a point where it reaches moon, and at that place, you do exactly reverse, because if you want to get into the orbit of any celestial body, what you need is, depending on at what distance you are there, if you give a critical velocity, it will go into a circular orbit. If you give less than the critical velocity, then you, you will get into an elliptical orbit. And if you put more, depending on what is your current velocity, things will change. So we had to do exactly reverse and then capture the moon. So if you see in a way, what was being done is like this. Each time the satellite comes close to the perigee, you add some velocity and the satellite keeps going further and further. So you can see the right hand top side showing you what is the apogee point that is going 71,000 kilometers. And the next time it will go even. And we made use of all these opportunities to keep doing so that it is like you have only a moped and you want to reach a far away distance. So you do not have enough strong engines. So that is the way we built this system. And this was also, in a way, unique uh, method. And now, in a way, we have perfected it because we have done almost five missions like this. Three of the lunar missions, one on the Mars mission, and another for the Aditya. In all of this, we made use of the same system. And then, when you come very close to the other celestial object, you reduce the velocity of what you have, and then keep reaching the circular orbit that is there for the moon. So this is how we were able to get into a circular orbit of moon in the current case, or even Chandrayaan-1 case also. So now I'll touch upon what, when we started our activity for 2008, see, like I said, initially the prime objective of our space program was to ensure that we provide specific solutions to various problems we are facing. But at the same time, you realize that if you want to improve your capability, your capacity, unless you work on more and more challenging problems, your ability to find solutions becomes limited. So by the time Chandrayaan, that's around 2002, 2003 time frame, it was realized that you need to work on more complex celestial missions for you to achieve a greater capability even for problem solving by satellites around Earth. So Chandrayaan-1 was conceived, and when it was launched in 2008, you can visualize that man had already landed on moon by that time, and a large number of probes had touched the surface of the moon. But still, Chandrayaan-1 gets the credit for discovering the presence of water on the moon. What this really showed is that in science and technology, it is never too late. You can always do something which others have not done, what is only needed is your ability to think and ability to conceive of various missions and perform that. So what was done in Chandrayaan-1, again with the limited resources of our launch vehicle, conceiving of a satellite, which actually was also an extremely good demonstration of how you can do international collaboration. 
we worked with almost five other countries and carried some of their payloads also in the satellite. And this mission was actually very successful because it in a way demonstrated a many things which were very different from what was believed up to that point. This slide shows you the various instrument that was sitting on that satellite. And then some of the salient results of uh, Chandrayaan-1 was presence of water molecules in the lunar exosphere and subsurface water ice deposits. This was one other thing. And then the presence of large expanses of crystalline feldspar, then reflection of solar wind protons, like that actually what this uh, satellite did was it also captured a large number of images, 3D images it generated. And one of the instruments that was carried on this, which was developed by NASA, also had the ability to detect presence of water and OH molecules. We also had a moon impact probe I'll touch upon subsequently, which measured the presence of even OH and water molecules as it descended from the satellite. So this showed in many ways, this is some of the images which were taken. In fact, what you see, one of the rails that is called, actually there is a region below which actually future human habitats can be there because it, it's almost like a tunnel and you can protect people or life forms from radiation effects, etc. So many of these were found using Chandrayaan-1 and a large number of papers also got published and protons reflected from magnetic anomaly regions, et cetera, were picked up. And then discovery of new population of suprathermal protons around moon. And then there is also an ionosphere, which was measured using the Chandrayaan-1 S-band radio occultation. In fact, what happened because of Chandrayaan-1 is, till that point, moon was considered to be bone dry. There was no water, was the general belief, but then, Chandrayaan-1 changed that perspective, and then it showed not only presence of water and OH molecules, but also the processes responsible for that formation was identified. And also, moon was considered to be geologically dead billions of years back. But then, some of the information collected from Chandrayaan-1 showed that dynamically, its volcanic, volcanic activity was active, not very recent. When we talk of recent in celestial things, it is still millions of years. But then those were the changes. And in fact, it is because of this significant new finding that there was a lot of interest again for going back to moon happened. And you have seen subsequently large number of probes and then missions started getting formed. And in the recent past also you have seen a very significant actually increase in the interest in moon, et cetera. One of the thing we carried on moon on the Chandrayaan-1 is what is called as a moon impact probe. In fact, it carried an object which came out from the satellite and in an uncontrolled manner, it went and hit the surface of the moon in the actually lunar south polar region. And this particular experiment was an inspiration from Dr. Abdul Kalam's idea that we should put the national flag on moon by carrying this. So 2008, this was done. And today, the place where this particular object landed is called as Jawahar Sthal, because there is a convention that you can demand based on what you have done certain things. And later, you have also heard how the current Vikram lander's place is called Shiv Shakti, et cetera. Then in this particular case, it was a 29 kg object which came down and it carried cameras, and also it carried a mass spectrometer. Mass spectrometer is an instrument which can measure a molecule in situ and tell what that molecule is. And based on that, you could identify. In fact, as it descended, it did look at OH and water molecules. But in science and technology area, if you want to prove what you have observed, you need to do a lot of validation and it did take significant amount of time. But by that time, because of the significant data which the American systems had and previous mission, they were able to demonstrate using their M cubed or the moon, moon mineralogy mapper, the presence of water they could discover. And this was the first instrument which our 
the mass spectrometer, which measured very close to the moon's surface presence of water. Then the moon imaging system took large number of pictures. I'll just run through some of the images. These were all taken in 2008. As the moon impact probe started descending towards the moon, it was taking pictures, and it was also rotating, spinning. So that's why you can see the images also rotating. And it went and touched the surface very close to what is called as a Malpert region. And that was the first object we were able to put in on moon. In Chandrayaan 2, obviously, what we were attempting is, of course, before this, the history was, initially, we were working with Russians, where Russians were supposed to provide us the lander. And Chandrayaan 2 was supposed to carry a Russian lander. But then again, a lot of geopolitical activities and their own program got delayed. So we decided we will build our own lander. And we built our own lander and conceived of Chandrayaan 2. And Chandrayaan 2, in 2019, it went into the moon orbit. And Chandrayaan 2, the objective was to improve on what we had done in Chandrayaan 1, and then build instruments and a lander and rover to touch down on the moon's surface. While in Chandrayaan 1, some of the instruments which made impact was developed by the other space agencies in Chandrayaan 2. Every instrument that we carried were our own. And we had built newer capabilities. For example, in Chandrayaan 1, there was a microwave sensor. And in Chandrayaan 2, we had a microwave sensor which were operating in two wavelengths and an infrared imager which was also operating up to five micron, being able to provide much more detailed data. And primary objective was, again, consolidate on what is the information on water on moon, more of lunar composition, then topography. In all these areas, we were planning to do the work with Chandrayaan-2. And of course, what happened in Chandrayaan-2 is, while the orbiter continues to function, we have collected data using the orbiter, and it is providing very valuable inputs. The, our attempt to land on the surface of the moon itself, we came very close to touchdown, but then we had some problems. I'll touch upon this later when I'm talking about Chandrayaan 3's touchdown itself, what were the issues. And then we were able to collect very significant amount of data using Chandrayaan 2, very high resolution images and multispectral and hyperspectral imaging. We were able to map the presence of argon on the lunar surface. And also, like I said, we carried a two-band microwave sensor. The microwave sensor operates in a way what is called as an active sensor. Active sensor, if you are familiar, when you take a picture using your mobile using sunlight, it is making use of the sunlight as a primary source. But when you take pictures using a flash in the mobile, it's an active sensor because you are providing illumination from your own sensor. In the microwave region, the source is always carried, and then it operates in a region beyond what we can see. Human beings can observe only between 400 to 700 nanometers. And then beyond this region, if you want to observe anything, then you have to build specific instrument which can operate in that and do. So microwave, also the advantage is it can penetrate through clouds, and it can penetrate it, it through various uh, certain obstructing surfaces, etc., and collect data. And another thing that happens on moon is there are certain regions on moon where sunlight never falls. They are called permanently shadowed regions. It is expected that water, if it is present, will find this region, gradually migrate it to there, and become maybe frozen ice. So if you are able to look at permanently shadowed regions, then that is where water, water ice, etc., is supposed to be there. And for that, using observation in very different wavelengths, you can do that. And then we also had solar X-ray monitor on that, which is a very highly sensitive instrument. And then we had this uh, synthetic aperture radar, which is actually an improvement over what was carried in Chandrayaan-1. And using this, and we were, again, the first to use a dual-frequency polarization-based instrument and make observation. And then how it operates is it illuminates a certain region. Based on the scattered or reflected signal, you pick it up, 
and then make sense out of what kind of reflection scattering happens and then based on that you study the various features you can see the kind of color images that you can create and based on that you can learn many things what is the dielectric constant what is the kind of surface roughness that is there whether what kind of objects are there all this becomes possible and we were able to identify again water ice ice bearing region using this fully polarimetric data and these were all significant additions to the scientific capability of what had been happening and this was also again another instrument operating in the what is called as a infrared region this was extending the wavelength region to much beyond what was covered in chandrayaan 1 and because of this we are able to actually tell many more things that are happening on the moon moon surface then actually the kind of images that are obtained probably if you see hyperspectral hyperspectral means you are taking images in many very narrow wavelengths and because of that you can study absorptions and then based on that what kind of uh, the minerals are there you can study so those are all the things and in addition to that unambiguous detection of water on the moon and then we also carried what is called as a class instrument which is like a fluorescence measurement illumination by the solar particles generates x rays on the moon surface and that can be picked up using that you can tell what kind of uh, materials are present calcium magnesium etc some of those things and then you can see subsurface features can be picked up you can look at craters and then you can look at permanently shadowed regions and another very important thing that was there in chandrayaan 2 which was also one of the reasons why we were able to succeed in chandrayaan 3 is use of this particular instrument what is called as orbiter high resolution camera ohrc you will be happy to know that this particular camera takes from any orbiting objects of moon the highest resolution images in fact we are providing this data to others now for their activity of landing etc slim japanese version also made use of this particular imaging data you can see the kind of fine details that you can get very small pebbles or even boulders that are there and using this data you can actually get lot of details about the place where you are going to touch down i will tell in a later slide how this ability of picking data with very high resolution helped us succeed in chandrayaan 3 so apart from that we also had cameras which could take 3d or three dimension see like we all have a stereo vision stereo vision is possible because the two eyes look at an object at slightly different angle and our brain does the synthesis of doing parallax based estimation of what is the distance of the object and distances and heights you can measure so same way if you carry two or more cameras looking at the same object at different angles you can use it for creating three dimensional surfaces so you can see how a crater looks like what is the depth of the crater and elevation of that all that is possible using this uh, stereo imaging system so this is also a crater known as sarabhai crater imaged by one of the instruments on chandrayaan so we also have a number of such observation you can also do probably you have heard meteorites when they strike the surface of the moon depending on the angle at which they hit the surface it creates a crater and throws up material and by studying the reflected signal from that you can even tell at what angle the crater would have been formed by the meteorite and lot of studies are possible now i'll come to chandrayaan 3 and how we were able to succeed in chandrayaan 3 while in chandrayaan 2 we had a problem see like i was telling you earlier one of the key things was we were building our technological capability of rockets progressively the kind of rocket engines we had built was once a rocket engine starts it can deliver a fixed force fixed thrust because that was sufficient for all our activities till geostationary orbit insertion because once an engine starts the fuel available 
keeps on getting into the engine and engine give, keeps providing the required thrust and then you provide the velocity. But what happens when you want to land on an object in a celestial sphere? You are at a particular height, you have a certain velocity which is called as a horizontal velocity. Now if you bring that velocity to zero, the object because of the gravity of the celestial object gets pulled towards the surface. So if you don't want it to fall, like whatever stone you throw up comes down, you have to give a compensatory force in opposite direction. That means exactly the G component of the celestial object, you have to provide to the object using an engine and then compensate. So if you do that, it remains stationary there. But our task is not remaining stationary like that, but to come and touch down. That means you have to constantly vary the thrust that you are providing in such a controlled manner that the velocity of the object as it comes down and touches the surface becomes very small in the range of one to two meters per second or about three to five kilometers per hour. So that means the engine you are building, you should be capable of changing the thrust in a controlled manner. Like when you are on a scooter or a mobile or even a car, you press the accelerator, it goes faster. You release the accelerator, it becomes slower. So that means this is called throttling. So you have to build throttleable engines. So you have to build throttleable engines. You have to modify the engine in such a way that the fuel which is entering the engine has to change. So it was a new capability that was being built. And then any new system when you are building, you go through a large number of developmental issues, etc. So in Chandrayaan 2, what we were attempting is we had put five engines on this lander and the lander when it was coming down and touching, all the engines had to perform in a synchronized manner. See, otherwise you can imagine the platform, if one engine is firing more, it can keep tilting back and forth. So that was one of the issues that were there. So what we did in Chandrayaan 2 was using this uh, new capabilities and because of certain mismatches in the behavior and also the kind of algorithms and software that was there, it was not able to handle that. So in Chandrayaan 3, what we did was, not only we modified all the capabilities, we also built a mechanism in the system such that you can test the performance of all these while you are in moon's orbit. So while in Chandrayaan 2, not all of that could be incorporated, in Chandrayaan 3, we made sure that the engines which are operating can be verified both for their fixed thrust and also for the variable thrust by verifying their function while it is in orbit. So since all this was built into that, we could succeed. So now I'll actually showcase to you what is the real challenge and how the whole thing hap happens. See, one of the things you need to visualize is if you want to go and touch down in a place you need to know exactly what is that surface where you are touching down. So in Chandrayaan 2, we had the region based on the images up to that point. That means 2019 is when we landed. Before that, using 2008, our Chandrayaan 1 images, we had five meter resolution. And we were depending on some of the images from others. But then with the kind of images we had, we could identify a region which is 500 meters by 500 meters. That was all that we had. And also the finer details of that region was to some extent limited. But in Chandrayaan 3, what we did using our own OHRC, we identified a region which was four kilometers by two kilometers in area. And even within that, any 150 meter diameter if you take, there is a possibility of you touching down there without your legs getting into a boulder or a crater. So now you see what has happened from 500 meter to two kilometer by four kilometer, the margin of error between your starting point to the end point, you have a huge error margin. That means all the mechanisms which you have built of changing your speed, controlling the speed, you can allow larger error. That means you can make your programs that much more robust. So that was one thing that happened. Second thing that happened is 
you will start at a point which is in the beginning, the left hand top, if you see, the object is moving almost at 1.6 kilometers per second speed. So your task is starting at a particular location at a particular instant of time, you know where you are, then progressively by measuring how much thrust you are giving and what kind of velocities are there, direction are there, you can keep calculating your position subsequently and come to the point of hovering and there you look above that region, take a picture, map that picture or match that picture with the one you have in reference and by comparison you can determine how much away you have to move from where you are. So that was, so you, starting point also, during the course of Chandrayaan-2 operations, we had built our ability to determine the orbit very accurately. So we knew the starting position more accurately. We had larger error margin in the end point. In addition to that, the amount of fuel you carry and the kind of engines that you are carrying, the engine also, if you are able to test it thoroughly, even when it is in space, you make trial engine firing and throttling. So we built all that so you could make sure that everything is ready and if there is any deviation in performance, we can modify our program and correct it. So that's where this particular activity in Chandrayaan 3, we were able to successfully do because whatever problems we faced in Chandrayaan 2, we corrected it using lot of ground tests you will see in one of the videos subsequently which I will show the kind of testing that had gone on ground. But even the object we carried to the moon, even while it was orbiting, we were able to verify its performance by exercising those capabilities and in case of need we could have corrected our programs and achieved this. So with this particular thing, the entire operation went off very smoothly and again many times people wonder how it is the, how is it that you are able to exactly tell at 604 you are going to land on a put so here is again one of the things you need to realize in space nothing is stationary no object can remain stationary there it's all the time moving so that when things are moving you need to know exactly what are the trajectories time at which where they are going to be so now what was the task we wanted to land on a particular location on moon, a latitude and longitude, and there sun has to be present at a particular elevation. Because if sun is at a very low elevation, even a small object can cast a shadow, and that shadow can prevent sunlight falling on the solar panels of our lander. So if the lander touches down a place and it is in the shadow of some other crater or boulder, then you will not get power. So you cannot afford to land exactly when the sun is just above the horizon. So you have to wait for sun to come at an elevation, a certain minimum elevation. So now sun itself, if you take 14 days of sunlight available on the moon's surface, first couple of days you have to wait so that no shadow is going to cause problem. So you know at that longitude and latitude, what is the time? So the day gets fixed, date gets fixed, time gets fixed, and then all the things you have to work backwards in time and then make sure that you land at a particular place with a particular time. So that's how the time also got fixed and then everything went as per plan and you saw how we were able to successfully achieve this. All the instruments that were built could be verified in operation and then went ahead. And then again, the large scale, the place where we landed, like I said, you were able to actually get the images of um, the place and you could get a four kilometer by two kilometer area. And then, see, so you can compare the two kind of data that is there, what was available to us earlier and what we had our own, the kind of resolutions that were there. And then in Chandrayaan 3, of course, the instrument itself, how it was done. Other improvements that were done is in Chandrayaan 2, the amount of fuel we carried was limited again because not only orbiter was there, in Chandrayaan 3, we removed the orbiter and we put extra fuel so that for any contingencies, we had more fuel available. And in fact, it was this excess fuel which allowed us to conduct the hop experiment which was done later. 
and then I'm sure many of you would have seen a lot of these details. So what I'll just try to show you is a small six minute video showcasing what all happens behind the scene before Chandrayaan-3 mission successfully does the activity.
after the completion of formal elements in the rover compartment, the rover was assembled onto the ramp using three tool bands. Detailed assembly mode ISC was carried out followed by mass property measurement, thermal vacuum test, solar panel assembly, and illumination test, EMA EMC test, and CATF ISI. This was followed by pre dynamic deployment of secondary rover ramp, primary ramp, and rover rollout from lander, and payload deployment to test Insta and Ramba, Chase, and the lander is made ready for further activities. Once the lander module was ready, it was stacked over the propulsion module to form the integrated module. EMI EMC, vibration test, acoustic test were carried out. Final finishing activities such as MLI CV, Chandrayaan 3 spacecraft, was made ready for shipment to space port at SDSC Shaft. Okay, so that gives you an idea of what all goes behind for making sure. I'll just quickly run through some of the other sensors that were there on the lander. There was a measurement for temperature, how it changes as you go into different depths. And then there was also a, a instrument which is measuring the seismic activity on the surface and then making sure that there, what is the variation in the electron density around the surface and then also the laser ablation measurement. That means you fire a laser based on the evaporation that happens, measure the atoms and molecules using a spectrometer, similarly alpha particle instrument, etc. So then today if you see beyond that, now we are looking at what is going to happen. ISRO JAXA lunar program is there. And beyond that, of course, the what has already been announced that both the space station by 2035 and 2040 Indian landing on the moon. So that's the target. So now you can visualize that when India decided to put the man around Earth in the before the 75th anniversary of independence, even before the target is completed, you have already seen the India setting a bigger target of landing on moon. And then what it shows is that is not an end in itself. It's only a beginning of a host of other activities. So what can be that? That means if you land on moon by 2040, what can be there beyond that? Can you use moon as a place for observatories? That means looking at from moon, both towards Earth and celestial thing, setting up observatories on moon, or moon as a habitat, create environment there where you can live, or moon as a place where you can exploit exploit whether minerals that are there, etc., or moon as a stepping stone for traveling beyond. Can you use it for going beyond moon to Mars or other planetary bodies or even beyond the solar system? And then lastly, you also use it as an international collaboration thing. So this is where now India is heading for future, making sure that the next generation and all of you have an opportunity to contribute. So you can visualize that life outside planet Earth means the areas in which one has to work is so huge. Every aspect of life becomes important. And it's here, there is an opportunity, and there is a provision. And if you make up your mind what you want to do and how you want to do, there is no limitation, no area of work from transportation to scientific discoveries, all areas are available. So I'll stop here, and if any of you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to take that question and answer. If supposedly Chandrayaan-3 was not, uh, the, the lander was not landed on 23rd August 2023, what would have been its next schedule? Before we started descent, if we had, we had to wait and remain in the orbit for almost another lunar day. So that means one lunar cycle you have to wait because every day you lose, you lose the duration for which you get sunlight and operate the instrument lander and rover gets restricted. So the only possibility would have been that you have to wait for one full cycle, keep the system in orbit. We would have lost some fuel that would have reduced our ability 
and then margins available etc would have been the issue it remain for 14 or 12 days was it uh, experiment only for 14 days or yeah actually the basic issue what you have to appreciate is on moon on the surface where wherever you are it's almost like 14 earth days of sunlight and 14 earth days of darkness when it gets into that dark phase temperatures go very low they go down to almost minus 200 to minus 250 degrees. So unless you have built your instrument and all the equipment that you have designed to withstand that lo such long durations of low temperature, then there is no way it can come back into operation. And the problem is, it's not that it's impossible to do that, but then the way to do is choose all the components such that they have verified for long exposure to low temperature and then after that exposure, they work. Then the cost of doing that would have been enormous, that is one. And the way others have done also is keep the temperatures hot by having an alternate source, like a nuclear power source, etc., heating the elements so that the temperature do not go to such low values. See, today we have components which can withstand minus 100 degree to plus 150 degree, etc., all mill standard if you see many of them. So you have to make sure that the components and the subsystem do not go beyond the temperature for which they have been designed and validated. If you can do that, you can survive indefinitely the period. At the thinking for future lunar missions. Yeah, future lunar missions, definitely we have already started working with uh, BARC also to find out how these uh, nuclear powered devices, what is called RTGs, radio thermal heating systems, which can provide not only heat energy, but also generating electricity from that so that you don't have to depend purely on solar power can be done. So these are also another areas between now and 2040 and even beyond if you look at, you need to find ways and means by which you can generate sources. See, for, for example, you also saw when we penetrated up to 100 uh, centimeters, that means one meter depth when you had gone, the temperature change is almost 80 to 90 degrees. Can you use this differential for generating power? So like that, there could be many things. How to find materials which can sustain. So there are huge opportunities for both research and coming up with solution. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your enlightening presentation. A couple of questions from our inquisitive college students. What inspired you to pursue a career in space science? Okay. Starting of the career in space science itself was not a, you can say in any way, very deliberate activity. But it so happened that when I was in uh, doing physics honors in, 19, in National College in, 19, in 1969, man landed on the moon. We heard all that in a radio. That, that time, video was not there, only through audio we could hear. So that was one of the things which was there. And it also so happened that originally I was planning to do medicine as my career. So when I completed my 12th stand, equivalent of 12th, pre-university pre at that time, one of the requirements was that for joining medicine, you should have completed 16 years of age. I was born on 22nd October, so the requirement was on 1st October, I should have completed 16 years. Though I had secured the highest marks in physics, chemistry, biology at the, from the Bangalore, means the Mysore University, getting a seat in medicine would have been assured, but because of this age limitation, I was not getting admission that year. So I decided I'll spend some time in using physics honors. So I joined National College and started doing physics honors. And then I did not look back, I continued. Then the space um, event happened. And later when I completed my course in uh, Indian Institute of Science in 75, Arya Bhatta had gone up in, October, in April of that year. I graduated around August. There was an opportunity to work in Ahmedabad for a program called Satellite for Earth Observation. So I had uh, applied for that particular post I got and then I joined there. And I had the, really the privilege of working on building optical instruments for satellite applications. 
and in a way you can say i have contributed when i started my career the first instrument we built had a resolution of 1 km and it was a 340 km by 340 km imager in two channels by the time i completed my career we had reached 30 cm resolution imaging system not only one wavelength hyperspectral and large number of different things so in a way it was you can say a sort of a quirk of a thing that 16 that 22 days shortage of completing 16 years changed my course of uh, life amazing and truly inspiring sir hope this answer is an inspiration to our young minds the next question what are the varied opportunities and scope available in space education for uh, bsc undergraduate students see today unlike in the earlier era what is available is much more much much larger because like i said once you want to take life and deal with life beyond earth the areas in which one has to work is so wide and so large and even when you are looking at building habitats outside earth whether it is an orbiting platform or on moon or mars etc the whole activity of construction worrying about materials surviving those conditions so the areas in which one has to work there is no limit so no matter what area you want to consider probably there will be opportunity for you to work in future activities so i don't think you should too much concern about which area you are picking up but whatever area you pick up you should definitely make sure that you understand that very well you are capable of making a difference in that field not only should you know detailed about one region but you also need to have sufficiently broad base like it's called a t you have a horizontal extension of many fields you are aware but in one field you have a deep knowledge so if you are capable of building your capability like that you will find acceptance in whatever you want to do and future like we see is enormous by 2040 if we want to land and beyond that if you have to go to the interplanetary travel from building instruments and vehicles to travel to actually building habitats providing living conditions from life so it's actually enormous i don't think you should really worry about that part what you should really worry about according to me is exploring things of your own capabilities what is it that you have and how you can enhance your ability to deal with various aspects of life a great motivation hope our students will definitely get motivated and think of pursuing a career in space education a question from the audience what are the potential benefits of future lunar exploration missions for india and humanity as a whole okay so here again probably there are few things we need to keep in mind if you look at earth because of the environment because of the atmosphere that happens lot of things that happen on the surface gets modified and on the lunar surface since there is not that kind of an atmosphere lot of things are preserved so by understanding moon and learning about what is there on moon will definitely help us understand the situation not only on earth what would have happened whether it gives us a clue to making earth more and more sustainable survivable is one question and then other thing is learning about moon itself like i said we can use it as a stopping point stop over point for traveling beyond so understanding the nearest celestial object which is making a huge influence to life on planet earth it's only when you understand how the parameters which get affected on the surface on earth and what are those objects which are influencing that and i don't think you need to really put too much of effort to understand that moon is a huge influence on life on earth not only because it is producing all those tidal effects but also producing the reflected sunlight reaching earth and the lunar cycles that are there 
So understanding what happens on moon is definitely one of the prerequisites of being able to provide better and better sustainable life on Earth itself, apart from traveling beyond and understanding the universe. Thank you, sir, for a resourceful answer that satisfies the requirement of the question. Uh, any question from the audience? Hello, sir. Yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Does the change in the governing body or the government of India affect the working of ISRO? OK. See, it is like asking, whatever you have to do, finally, there are things you need to be provided resources for doing what you need to do. Who is it that can provide the resources? Obviously, in India or in anything, it is the governing body. So if the governing body is able to provide whatever resources you are asking for what you want to do, you can do the job. So our problem, if you take from the past, if you see, India itself, economically, if you look at, was in a very poor condition, and it was gradually building its capability. Today, we are the fifth largest economy. So obviously, what the government, government can provide bodies like us is much more today than what it would have been possible a few decades back. That is one aspect. Second aspect is what also happens is no matter who is there in the governance, when you are looking at India as an entity, what India should be doing, how India should progress, there are again certain compulsions which will come. So it is definitely those who are in the power will definitely make an impact whether something will happen faster or slower. And they also have a lot of limitation. Though sometimes they may want to provide something, they have their own constraints. So these things play out depending on your own economic strength. Today we are the fifth largest. By the time you become third and first, the amount of money India can spend on these programs is much more than what it is doing today. So definitely those who govern will have an impact on the activity. Hello. I have a second question for you, and I'm satisfied with your answer. Uh, the Shiv Shakti point makes the, marks the spot where Chandrayaan 3's moon lander successfully touched down the lunar surface. There was a controversy on this topic, linking it to religion. How do you, as a working person at uh, ISRO, take these controversies? I think one of the key things you need to realize is, in life also, there is energy is present, and energy in its various manifestation happens. And how you make use of the energy, when you say this is a point which is there, see if earlier, for example, like I said, the point where the moon impact probe touched, it was called as the Jawahar Sthal. So some name was given. So you can give whatever name you want to give. It's only a point of recognizing, and in recognizing that, it is your culture, your knowledge, and your heritage all comes into picture. So it is up to the people who are actually operating to worry about this aspect. And I don't, I will see it as recognizing that a place where something landed is being given a name which is acceptable to the people of the land and the culture and the heritage they have. Nothing wrong in that. So, uh, not a question, so I have uh, two, three doubts. See, whatever knowledge that we gather about space is from the newspapers and the t electronic media, as we are not the students of physics or astronomy. So one was, uh, what is this cryogenic engine, and why was it so essential, and why we were denied that technology? That was one. Second was... Shall I complete the answer yeah, for yeah. that? Okay, first. See, one of the thing is, whatever rockets you are building, that rocket, when you have to carry objects and all that, its ability to generate the force and how much minimum mass it is using in doing that and how long it can provide that force is important. See, if cryogenic engine, the advantage is both liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, which are the two essential components, which when they come together, they produce the required force. So you are storing the material in the liquid form and you are calling it cryogenic because the temperatures are very low. Now the cryogenic engine, what it does is, 
the liquid in hydrogen and liquid oxygen which is stored after that it is converted into gaseous form and in gaseous form it is brought to a place the engine and where they come together they generate because of the combustion generate the thrust so now the cryogenic engine is important because it is with smaller mass you are able to generate larger force and higher and higher forces you are able to generate is what is required for you to carry heavier mass into space and for that mass you have to, unless you provide a required velocity it will not do the task of going around earth or going to another point so the basic idea the cryogenic requirement is do, being able to use less uh, resource not resources lesser mass for generating the required forces that was the thing of course the challenge is storing them at very at the required temperature because otherwise quickly heat in leak will make it evaporate and go away so you have to keep it refrigeration system should be such that it is kept uh, at very low temperatures and then you can imagine the engine which is actually firing even for one second if it is not cooled sufficiently engine will melt so the technology is very involved so because of that it was difficult while one superpower was ready to give another superpower ensured that it did not happen and why is again it's a human nature once you have achieved certain capability you don't want everybody else to achieve that because your dominance goes away that is one the second thing is when such you come very close to doing it they are ready to give you that technology because they don't want you to go further in that anyway that is aside the basic answer to your question is cryogenic technology is basically making use of lower mass material and providing higher ability to provide forces okay thank uh, you sir the next is uh, whether uh, we are following this elliptical path to sh go to the elliptical path uh, yeah because our engine capability is, is less. less correct uh, does uh, us also follow the same method or do they go directly no no you saw for example just few days back one of the my elon musk rocket took straight in 5 days they reached yeah. the moon whereas we took almost 20 days etc so depending on the rocket capacity to provide you can do in a shorter period and they have much heavier engines much more capable engines we have not yet built such capability that's where the resources what she was asking how much resource is there if given the resource you can build higher capacity so currently what we had is a limited capacity so we augmented it using our satellites and the lastly if we can have such any uh, cryogenic engines such uh, of such a uh, technical scale why we are not able to build engine for tejas give why we can not build engine for our tejas aircraft okay. when no. we are building such a fine engine for to send uh, tons to uh, okay. to to moon why we can't be, we yeah. why we have to import rolls royce yeah i agree so this is where again another thing what you have to see is different domains have so many different aspects of life that comes into picture if you are to really look at it in a sense when we got independence aer aeronautical industry in india actually had lot of capacity some of that was not nurtured and if it had been nurtured probably today it would have been a different thing but lot of things happen because of people who are actually running the systems have their own priorities and what they think is right or wrong determines the course of the various uh, things so whereas in space they were you are able to do it because you are not actually bound by the constraints of land you are doing everything outside and there was not too many heritage things there were very few people who were working in that area at that time whereas aeronautics had too much of dominance of others that concludes our question and answer session let's give a big round of applause to shri kiran kumar ji for enlightening responses and to all our audience members for their thoughtful questions